best customers are executing the team model in the real estate space. And so we want to advocate for this concept, not just to sell more follow-up subscriptions, but to be a value and to educate the community, create a movement, find a rallying place for people that see the world a little bit the same way that we do. You have to use your intuition when you're looking at data and the data isn't always right. If you are innovating, you must be evangelizing. That's to say, if you're either solving a known problem in a truly new and unique and different way, the world doesn't understand that the current solution is inferior. We've got this new, different, better way to solve this problem. Or if you're solving a problem people don't even know that they have, you need to be evangelizing. We are in an AI revolution and Salesforce is helping customers navigate each new wave of AI. To learn more about the expert guidance and resources they have available, visit sfdc.co slash Salesforce customer success. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Experts of Experience. I'm your host, Lauren Wood. Today, I'm speaking with Ethan Butte, the chief evangelist at Follow Up Boss, a real estate CRM platform. Previously, he was the chief evangelist at a video messaging platform, BombBomb. And Ethan is also a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, having written two books, Human-Centered Communication and Rehumanize Your Business. Last but certainly certainly not least, and I'm sure there's so much more that I'm not even mentioning here, but Ethan also knows the podcasting world well, having hosted multiple podcasts on the customer experience topic, and now his latest show, The Evangelist. Ethan, it's so wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I, As you said, I love the podcast format, and your invite was very warmly received. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's start it off by just defining your role for everyone, because you are a chief evangelist, and I'm not sure everyone understands really what that role is all about. So please tell us. Sure. So first of all, nobody does, <laughs> you know, so um, I'll give you a medium sized story. Um, I did something several years ago that I had done a handful of times at that point, which is reach out to a podcast host and invite myself to host them as a guest on their own show. And my friend Sangram Vajra, he was a co-founder and chief evangelist at a software company called Terminus at the time. And he said, that sounds super fun because I proposed doing it around his, his title, chief evangelist. And uh, he said, I'll do you one better. Find three more chief evangelists and I'll run it as a four-part series once a week for a month. So I did the series. It was awesome. I got some great people, including Guy Kawasaki, arguably the first secular evangelist. Um, he is chief evangelist at Apple years ago. Um, wrote a book, his first book 30 years ago, included an entire chapter on evangelism um, called The Macintosh Way. And, and today he's the chief evangelist at Canva, which most people are familiar with. So um, it had some really great guests in that series, wrote up a heavyweight blog post on it. It ranked very, very well for a number of years. And it just started bringing at first, it resulted in my title change to chief evangelist. And second, it started bringing other evangelists toward me who were wondering, or is anyone else doing it or people considering the role? What the heck is it? Um, and so I ended up just kind of building this kind of informal community around it and decided to start interviewing them on the show to answer the question uh, much more concisely. In general, when you are evangelizing, uh, I'll share two things here and then give it back to you, Lauren. One, if you are innovating, you must be evangelizing. That's to say, if you're either solving a known problem in a truly new and unique and different way, right? The world doesn't understand that the current solution is in, you know, inferior. We've got this new, different, better way to solve this problem. Or if you're solving a problem people don't even know that they have, um, uh, you need to be evangelizing. And evangelism is about the problem, not about the product. It's about escaping the, the limitations of brand and brand messaging, product features, benefits, et cetera. It's about creating a much bigger tent, a much bigger conversation, a much bigger party. It's about creating a movement. And yes, your competitors should be part of that movement. If you are moving in the approximately the same direction um, and you're trying to advance this movement, you need a function uh, that you may or may not title evangelism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are evangelizing whether or not they consciously know it. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. So in your role at Follow Up Boss, how does this take place? Like, what are your, what does your day to day look like as a chief evangelist? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I've been with the team for about four months now, and my first charge was to start a new show. And uh, it, 
essentially the concept that I'm evangelizing is that the team model in the real estate business is one that more people should be considering. Um, it, it's a, it's in contrast to the traditional brokerage model. It's not new, but we identified, uh, as a team and as a company that there weren't a lot of people talking about it in a consistent manner with people who have been there, done that, who are, you know, active and iterating. And so that was my first charge was to, uh, develop a new, essentially a media brand, real estate team OS, uh, develop the concept for the show create the show, start executing it, podcast format, YouTube, social, weekly uh, email with unique content in it. And so that's essentially what I've been up to out of the gate. But in general, um, some of our best customers are uh, executing the team model in the real estate space. And so uh, we want to advocate for this concept, not just to sell more follow-up boss subscriptions, but to be of value and to educate the community, create a movement, find a rallying place for people that see the world a little bit the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. That's great. And when you say team, you mean like teams of agents, right? Correct. Yeah. Got it. Trad traditionally, just really quickly for folks mm -hmm. that aren't familiar with real estate, it, traditionally, over the past many decades, if you were a successful real estate agent, you were wondering what was next for you and your business, you would very often become a broker owner. You would buy into a franchise model uh, like a Remax or a Keller Williams or something else, um, uh, and you'd become a broker owner. But that's a completely different job. It's a completely different function. What a lot of agents have started doing over the past decade or so is instead of becoming a broker owner, which is a challenging business for a variety of reasons, they're just bringing, they're supporting themselves with some full-time staff directly, uh, and they're bringing more agents alongside them and essentially building an organization inside someone else's brokerage. Um, and of course, it's it's morphing. Some people are building brokerages that are completely teams. So they're called team bridges. So anyway, now these are some <laughs> of the things I'm exploring. It's super fun. I, I, I'm really intrigued by it. I enjoy the conversation. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in it's in a way a return to where I was with BombBomb about seven or eight years ago where our primary, like the first market we ever connected with and got real traction in was the real estate community. Mm. Yeah. It's funny because I worked at Compass, the real estate tech company for about five years. So I know everything you're speaking about really well. And I would get a lot of bomb bomb videos. <laughs> from yeah, sales totally. people. yeah. So I get it. Good. Um, <laughs> but moving on to what you've written about, and I love the topic very much of human-centered communication. For our listeners who may be less familiar with that concept, can you kind of define human-centered communication? Yes, absolutely. It's a framework that I developed with my longtime friend and team member, Steve Passanelli. Um, he was uh, my CMO at BombBomb, Bomb, and he is my current CMO at Follow Up Boss. So, you know, when you, when you, when you find people that you love working with and are very complimentary with, um, very often people uh, move around with one another. So he took the lead and I followed him uh, to Follow Up Boss. But uh, we were looking for uh, you know, you already mentioned you'd receive some bomb bombs, video email, video messages in place of faceless typed out text. So the first book, Rehumanize Your Business, was the what, why, who, when, and how of video email and video messaging. Like, what the heck is it? Who's doing it? Why, when, et cetera. As the movement around video email and video messaging grew, and we had a lot more competitors coming into the space, some of them were very well backed uh, with VC funding, like hundreds of millions of dollars poured into the video email and video messaging space it started getting a little bit commoditized and it was starting to get abused from our perspective. And so we were looking for a framework to level up beyond the mechanics of record and send a video message uh, to what is this really about? And what we landed on was a framework that we ended up titling human-centered communication. We borrowed a bit from a 30 or 40 year old design practice called human-centered design. And it blends uh, viability, feasibility, and desirability. Vi uh, feasib uh, viability is what's necessary for business success. What is our what is our desired outcome here? It could be a revenue goal. It could be a customer count. It could be a registrants for a webinar. It could be people showing up at an open house. Whatever our business goal is uh, needs to be balanced with feasibility. What does technology actually allow us to do? Um, and then the third piece is desirability. What do humans actually need and want? And Sadly and oddly, when anyone puts on their sales and marketing hat, um, especially if you have to wear multiple hats in your role or in your business, 
you generally start with viability. What do I need and want? I need X amount of revenue. I need X number of closed transactions. I need X number of subscriptions. I need X number of registrants or attendees or subscribers or whatever. And then you go to feasibility. Uh, what does technology allow us to do? Well, of course, technology is less expensive and more powerful than ever. Uh, you and I have certainly both seen abuses of AI as well as you know good uses of it, among other, many other things. I just, in general, I'm thinking about sales automation and marketing automation and the number of unsolicited, unwanted, not useful, irrelevant emails, voicemails, text messages, social posts, et cetera, all of this stuff is noise. It's And in fact, it's pollution to the degree that it takes us off task. And so um, it blend that in with the idea that we have um, cyber attacks, phishing schemes, malware, et cetera. Is this email from who it says it's from? Is this link safe to click? Is this attachment safe to download? Or is it going to like hijack my whole laptop and ruin my life for the next three weeks. Um, so, so this blend of noise and pollution in the digital environment calls for putting first and foremost the third leg of that stool. Again, what do we actually need and want in our business? What does technology allow us to do? And what do humans actually need and want? So the framework is simply a, a means of, of putting other people's needs, wants, and interests on a level playing field or on equal footing with your own. And I know that sounds really, really simple, but if we think about what other people need and want from this message, from this post, in this moment, whatever, and we design with that first and foremost in balance with the two other things, this isn't pure altruism. It needs to be beneficial to you and your business. It needs to be you know, profitable at some way. It needs to provide a return on your investment of time, energy, resources, but if you're not thinking about in the design process of whatever message or communication or piece that you're putting out, um, what is the return on someone else's time and attention, ROTA? If you're not thinking about return on others' time and attention, you're teaching them that you are not worth their time and attention. You're teaching them that they're worth an unsubscribe, a block, uh, a do not receive, report as spam, report as you know, a bad number, whatever the case may be. And so um, if we're not thinking about that now, last, last thing, and I'll give it back to you. If we're not thinking this way now, we're training humans that, that we are not worth their time and attention and they can easily ignore us, block us, in addition to doing things like say bad things about us and write us negative reviews. More importantly, the machines that are going to be making these decisions for us going forward, right? There's going to be, and we already have it. It's it's when Gmail introduced filtering on your inbox, you know, a decade ago, and there's the promotions and updates and all these other things, right? That's a, that's kind of a dumb version of what we have now and what we'll continue to have increasingly going forward. There's so much noise in the environment that we will increasingly rely on machines to make these decisions for us, to surface the most valuable things, to show us the things that we should look at, to tell us the things that we should be responding to. And if we're not teaching people who are now teaching the machines, then we're going to disappear from the people that we're trying to build our business with and for. And so um, anyway, I obviously care a lot about it. I interviewed 11 experts for it with Steve. And um, yeah. so there are a lot of perspectives in there, not mm -hmm. just our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really funny that we're talking about this because, and this was even separate to me knowing that we were going to have this conversation, but literally like an hour ago at lunch, I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, we both have coaching businesses. Um, I'm a leadership coach and, you know, I, I have the word coach on my LinkedIn and that is driving probably three to four sales emails into my inbox per week that are really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I am like I'm like how do I stop these whoever they are it's like they're really they're not very well written emails they're not very targeted to me they don't really have a lot of information I'm annoyed because it's wasting my time to even open this and read it let alone the question of did I just get like a virus for opening this because this feels so out of the blue so I mean and I'm sure that whoever is sending those emails there is someone who has good intentions. So if we're thinking about sales outreach as a, as a topic or a, one of these areas where we do send a lot of communication, how can people think in a more human-centered way? Like what are some examples of things that you would say would kind of help to make those types of communications more effective? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, first, I'll restate myself, which is 
What do they need and want? That should be the guiding principle before you record a single second of video, before you type a single word, before. So there's that. Yeah. Uh, there's, of course, the whole process of journey mapping. And it, it, journey mapping is this idea of like, you know, what is what is what are the stages of relationship from, you know, whatever triggered you to start getting those emails or the precursors to that all the way through, you know, uh, some type of commitment or purchase uh, and in an ongoing relationship, whether that's repurchasing or renewing the subscription or, you know, whatever a healthy long term growth relationship looks like with your and not just your customers, but also strategic partners, referral partners, et cetera, whoever whoever is important in your business ecosystem. So first is thinking about their needs and interests. A really practical way to to communicate that, and you know, I was very forward facing. I had a ton of direct customer access in person and virtually, and in inboxes, et cetera, um, in my role at BombBomb. Bomb. And I would constantly get people asking me, you know, why didn't people open my email, or why didn't this video get played, or why didn't she reply, and these types of things. And like bonus points for being curious and wanting to do better the next time. But it's it's looking backward, not looking forward. And it's about you. It's not about them. Why didn't I get what I want on that thing that I already did? So instead, if we can just start to, as a habit, as a matter of course, as like the way that we operate, if we start moving more toward, and none of us is perfect. I've sent a ton of garbage emails in my life. But if we can start moving toward, why would she play this video? Why would he reply to this thing? Why would they fill out the survey? Why would they open this email and do it again next week or next month or next quarter or whatever the cadence is? And if we can start going that way, that's a thing. Also, we have all these tools to set up and execute and report on things that are happening digitally, whether that's auto posting to social or whether that's auto sending a series of six emails first, as soon as this thing happens, then another one 24 hours later, then another one three days after that, then another one five days after that, et cetera, et cetera. Like we have all these machines to do this and they all have reporting, but so infrequently do we do a couple of different things. One, look at the actual reporting and saying, gosh, maybe we should pull out email three uh, because we, you know, it's inhibiting what's happening later on, or maybe we should change this email, or maybe we should flip these two. Um, that's one. Like, how can we improve what we're doing based on what other human beings are telling us with their real behavior? In addition, you can layer an anecdotal feedback as well. People, you know, if you get three replies that say, for the love of God, please stop. <laughs> you know, that that's a that's a very clear sentiment. You know, it's not just like please unsubscribe or I clicked unsubscribe. That's another thing to look at too, by the way. The other thing is, especially if you're in a medium to large size organization, what are other people seeing, hearing, doing, right? Like what are our customers telling us that they really enjoyed about the pre-sale process and how can we do more of that? What are salespeople telling us uh, are the main concerns or objections that people are coming to the calls with? And can we maybe layer some of that into the emails because they obviously wonder about it and it's 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 something that's top of mind so they would bring it up and it's something that we're not satisfying in whatever type of communication or process that we're creating. I'm speaking as a marketer here, but in general, when we think about marketing sales, customer service, customer success, whatever you want to call that, account management, um, the kind of the marketing and sales typically uh, pre-sale, uh, account management, customer service, customer success, typically post-sale. These two sides of the customer creation and customer retention piece need to have a lot more conversation. And in that way, we're weighing more voices. We're weighing more perspectives. We're not just putting on our clever hat or worse, lazily going into chat GPT and saying, write me a thing that does this, that, and that. And here are six facts about my business. And these are the types of people I'm trying to communicate with. Like, do that, but then layer it in with what are your analytics telling you and what do, what are your other team members telling you? What are mm -hmm. real people telling you with their voice and with their mm -hmm. behavior? Mm -hmm. As you've probably heard, many of the guests on Experts of Experience talk about using Salesforce to build great customer experiences. Are you using Salesforce? If not, take a look at the world's number one AI CRM and how it can help you build stronger customer relationships by visiting sfdc.co slash Salesforce customer success. And what are they telling you at different stages in the journey? I think you're Great highlighting ad. something so important there where, you know, I mostly operate in the post-sale environment and it is, I've had 
the sales team come and train my customer success team. Like they're really good at getting people to be interested and, you know, getting them on the phone and all of this. And so how can we learn from the pre-sale in the post-sale? What are things that people say in the pre-sale that we can also continuously build on in the post-sale and vice versa? What are people saying in the post-sale that are really important to them or things that they realize about your tool that is really helpful or really annoying down the line that we can then, you know, make sure that our our friends in the pre-sale world are, are considering in their communications? I feel like that is a Absolutely a broken loop. Uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, the range of folks listening, but in general, some of them will be familiar with the idea of sales and marketing alignment. It's been a theme. It's been a topic forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, you know, essentially, it boils down to sales saying these leads that you're giving us suck, and marketing saying you don't follow up on the leads and close them <laughs> at a high enough rate. Like that's the essence of it. So, like yeah. that that loop has been worked over and over and over again. The loop that you describe from the from customer service from customer success from account management back at who are the good customers that are actually staying and then you know kind of reverse engineer that who are there who are the salespeople that tend to create the best customers or help cr- touch the gr- best customers um what are the marketing channels what are the marketing messages who are these types of people like that loop is so broken in so many businesses or just absent like the feedback from who's actually staying and buying again or continuing to subscribe back into the front end just like doesn't really exist in most businesses Completely. And this is going a little bit off topic because now we're getting into the customer success world, which I can talk about forever. But I was literally talking to a client about this like yesterday and I was asking like, what are the customers that are really good? And why are you going after people that was talking to the sales team? Like, why are you trying to sell to the people who are not those people? (laughs) Like we know who sticks with the product in the long run, but it requires that pre post sale alignment to really say like, post sale to say, we want more of these customers. They're really good. They're much more likely to upsell. They stay with us for a long time. They're loyal and they speak about us to their friends. Like how do we really, you know, put them in a, I'm like, I'm making like a box (laughs) with my hands, but just kind of like uh, a persona that we go after. I think it's, yeah, it's something, it's a big opportunity that is not taken often enough. So I wanted to go back to something else that you had said around AI, because I think when we, when we say human centered communication and AI, I think it's a wild west out there in how we're actually finding a balance of those two. What do you think? What are you seeing? Um, in general, I would say, uh, some very obvious things like the answer is with, not instead of, uh, in general, it's humans with machines, not machines in place of humans in general. The the worst social posts, the worst emails, the worst, I mean, gosh, people are doing SEO oriented blog posts straight out of the box, like straight out of the machine. Like, it's like, this is not the way it's, it's help yourself, spur yourself, get a foundation, get an outline, and then layer in your own personality. I mean, I'm of the mind. Uh, that customer experience is your only differentiator left in almost every business. There are very few industries in which there are legitimate, defendable moats around your business. Experience is the differentiator in a world of product and service parity. That's to say you launch a new feature, you launch a new mechanism, you launch a new process. Anyone else can knock it off in a matter of quarters if you're lucky, months if you're not, weeks if you're not, days or even hours, right? Especially in software, but really in a lot of other businesses. So I'm thinking about a a great customer service, customer experience guy, Shep Hyken, who told me a story about, um, he ended up uh, changing the place that he bought his next car after buying five cars from the same dealership because this new place would go pick up his car, take it back to the shop for service and then bring it back to his house. He didn't need to bring it in for oil changes or repairs or anything else. They would do all that for him, right? Well, anyone else could design that in a matter of weeks or days if they wanted to, right? So that's that's what I mean by parity. So what's different is the way that we make people feel. How do we make them feel about themselves? How do we make them feel about their proper opportunity that brought you into a relationship, maybe a commercial relationship? How do we make them feel about each of your individual people that they communicate with? How do you make them feel about like the intangible stuff? Like, you know, when they see your theme colors and your logo and some of these other visual identity pieces, like, you know, what does that, what does that trigger for them? And they'll never be able to clearly, well, 
very infrequently can they ever explicitly and clearly communicate it to you because it's all subconscious. And the vast majority of our mental processes are sensory and emotive. They are subconscious. That's to say we're not aware of them, but those are the, the, the thoughts and feelings that guide our conscious thoughts, that then guide our words and our behaviors. And, and very easily, we can all agree that what other people do and say guides your business outcomes. That's to say, the way we make people feel guides our business outcomes through the process I just laid out. So um, in light of that, thinking about uh, the various ways that uh, we're interacting with people, it needs to feel like it has something to it that is foreign about the other person. And I think if you're going to some generalized, uh, tidy, clean, approximately competent, but very often contextually irrelevant feedback that you're getting out of something like ChatGPT, you're not going far enough. There are a number of ways to leverage it. Taking the output and publishing it, and I'm using that in a general sense, is not the way. You need to layer in some sense of who is this for, who am I, what are we about, how do we do this, et cetera. So um, it's with, not instead of, the middle way is always the right way. In almost any situation, way that or that other thing that's completely opposite, neither one of them is rarely the right answer. It's almost always somewhere in the middle. And so I think that's what it is here too. So the laziest people are just straight cranking yeah. for easy, automated, fast stuff. And mm -hmm. I can't think of many places where that's a good idea. Yep. I could not agree more. I mean, we are still in early stages of AI and perhaps, too. perhaps there will be AI that is able to think about those things that you just mentioned. You know, how is this actually benefiting the person we're speaking to? What are their needs? Like, how do we, how do we relate to their experience? But it's definitely not there yet. And you can you can feel it. You know, even in written communication, you can feel if this isn't really adding up. You know, it doesn't have that humanness to it. Yeah. Or it's not for me in this moment. Like even that, right? Like, I mean, you just think about it, in almost every business, data is still a challenge. Uh, are we getting the right stuff? Is it going into the right place? Can we access it? But most importantly, is it even hygienic? Like, can we trust this data, right? Like, these are all problems that we're all struggling with almost all the time, unless you're in a very, very sophisticated or clever or amazing or lucky business. Most people are struggling with the quality and accessibility of their data. And so this idea of making something for the right person in the right moment remains a holy grail. and even if you have like very specifically trained AI, it's being trained on incomplete things. By the way, I just saw a piece last night about, the, and this isn't new either, but for example, the inherent racism in a lot of data sets and the way that the decisions are coming out of these machines. But like, if you don't have this handle on, if you're not working with, and I mean truly with, and frankly, prompting is an art, you can get a lot closer to a highly relevant message. The more information, the more you kind of like coax and give and take and manipulate and work it. Um, that's what I mean by with. Um, but but the more you rely on it quickly and easily, and I would say the same thing about a spreadsheet, right? It's, it's a completely different thing to build a spreadsheet, and to work it, like to get your hands dirty in it, I, it's metaphoric. It's, yeah. You can't actually get your hands dirty in it. Um, but, but like versus seeing a summary overview report, having someone send it to you, you spend 30 seconds looking at it. Where do you have the greater amount of understanding that can be turned into real tangible value for yourself or other people? It's in the deal where you get your hands dirty and you work it and you understand it and you manipulate it. You And then, and then we start seeing other people's reports. You have this intuitive sense that like, that's not quite right. I don't try, like, tell me more about that. Where did that come from? Tell me more about that. What's the underlying assumption, et cetera, et cetera. Like, so it both and again, I guess mm -hmm. is where I'll end that. <laughs> For sure. I do. There is, you know, when it comes to AI, you're saying, you're mentioning something that I'm really excited about, which is helping us to see where people are at and being able to pick up on, oh, they were, you know, doing this thing on our website or they mentioned this person to their salesperson. And now we can actually glue that data together to understand what experience they're probably having. But 
I fully agree. We need to be using our intuition and gut checking. Like, does this feel right? Because there are, it is still technology. There are still mistakes and we are still humans and <laughs> we need to still acknowledge that. So, so yeah, I'm curious, you know, kind of going back to the topic of evangelism and how that connects to human centric communication like what what role would you say that plays i mean that is you in a nutshell so. yeah i, I love i love this question and the way that you put that together it's um so what we've been talking about a bit and especially in terms of sales and marketing is inbound and outbound right um uh, outbound is is exhausted in a lot of different ways. There's still people that are finding some success with it and are doing it in a way that's respectful of other people and that's they're generating good response. But in general, let's just say, you know, outbound phone calls and text messages and emails, um, it's pretty tired, right? The sales and marketing playbook is pretty tired right now. And then so the other side of that is inbound, which HubSpot pioneered, you know, 15 or so years ago, um, and it's still useful in a lot of different ways, but a lot of the traditional stuff is broken as well. Um, and by that, I mean, I'm not going to fill that form out because a, you know, you should probably ungate it because B, I don't want to give you five pieces of, of my information in exchange for this download or whatever I'm getting access to, because C, I already know that three quarters of the ones that I do this for suck, right? Like, and, and everybody knows this stuff now. So we know the games of outbound and inbound, so they're not producing the same return. And the logical outcome is not more, right? So this idea of like, oh, it takes seven touches. Now it takes 17 touches. And, the, you know, next year it's going to take 28 touches. I mean, the logical conclusion is like 1,500 touches touches from your bot to my bot, and maybe my bot will surface it to me. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And so some of the language that I really like right now is nearbound. This idea of not constructing all your stuff and your strategy and your messaging and your packaging and your pricing and all this and going to market, right? We hear go to market. It's the, the idea of nearbound is living in market. Go out in the market, be with the market, know how the market talks, be one of the community members, be one of the movement leaders, be one of the movement participants in someone else's movement, live in market. And so, um, you know, typically this concept of nearbound is adjacent to like partnerships, like growing your business through partnerships with other companies who have similar values and similar customers and complementary uh, features, benefits, et cetera. Um, like your products work well together, your service works with their product, these types of things. But in general, I think the idea of nearbound can be applied much more broadly. And some industries have this a little bit more inherent and others don't. I think, you know, I come from software and so it doesn't, right? It's this let's you know, build all the stuff behind the scenes and then splash it out, you know, and sometimes we'll do that paid. Sometimes we'll do it organic. We'll do some outbound. We'll do some inbound. Instead, just go out and live in market. And evangelism plays a perfect role here because that's who the evangelist is. The evangelist typically has some authority and credibility in the space, maybe even an audience or a following potentially, but certainly a network of other people who they know. They are a subject matter expertise. They're not a creator or an influencer per se. An influencer develops a platform and then leverages it in exchange for something, right? Like, yes, I, you can, you know, I'll include you in my thing, um, you know, for, as long as you pay me for it, or as long as you give me something else in exchange, a creator doesn't have, you know, at least the way that it's most popularly used, doesn't have that same gravitas business acumen network, um, decade or decades of experience actually doing the thing. I have been in your shoes and therefore I'm coming alongside you. Yes, I'm a representative of this company, but I'm not coming to sell you anything. I'm here to help you with the problem, to talk about the problem, to learn about the problem, to live in market with you so that I can understand, help facilitate in part to generate good feelings, in part to generate opportunities that I can hand off very warmly to the sales team, in part to re-engage an account that bought this thing six months ago, but never really fully adopted it. And when they made the initial purchase, it was only seven, you know, 25% of the potential, you know, growth that we could have inside that account. So like bring in the evangelist to remind, engage, light up, educate, entertain at some level, et cetera. And so I think this is my last offer here. There is something very distinctly, uniquely powerful about the human embodiment and the human expression of your company's product, 
service, best practices, mission, values, team, community, et cetera. There's something different about you and I doing this in a conversation, people listening to us. By the way, I'm, I'm a 1X podcast listener. I know it's a little bit of a purist play, but there's something powerful about a one-to-one -one conversational experience that other people are invited into you could publish it. I don't know if you publish transcripts of these, but you could sit down and read the transcript of our conversation, but it is going to be a shallow, even hollow version of what you and I are doing right now. So um, I would extend that to say, when you look at all of the digital touch points that we're increasingly rely relying on, and I hate to say things like post-COVID this far removed, but you know, and when everything went digital and virtual from a from a conversational, transactional perspective, right? There's no more, you know, getting on planes and going out to nice dinners in order to close the account or a lot less of it than ever before, which is fine. But like this, some of these relationship dynamics have gone missing. And so how do we restore some of that? How do we bring these flat messages and flat experiences more to life? I would suggest that if you have the right person or the right people, to put in some type of an evangelist position, um, you're certainly moving in this direction of um, a more differentiated, more human and more powerful, more memorable, more remarkable and more useful experience. Mm -hmm. I'm so inspired right now. <laughs> it, I mean, it makes it makes so much sense. And you're really it's clicking something for me. I mean, I've worked with chief evangelists before. I understand what it is, but you're, when we talk about, you know, that human centered communication and how like that is really important to actually connect with your customer. And then you have someone who is like the living kind of version of the company who's actually going out there and speaking to people about use cases and who they are in terms of your customer, like actually getting to know them and, and yeah, being able to just like interact is really great. And more companies should do this. Why don't, why doesn't everybody company have a chief evangelist? <laughs> uh, f well, for, first of all, that's what we're exploring on chief evangelist. And we can check it out <laughs> at chief evangelist.com or in YouTube at chief evangelist and in your pod podcast player, the, the role takes on a lot of different shapes. Almost every role mm -hmm. is bespoke. Yeah. Um, I would say the single biggest challenge is that the ROI is not clear. Um, the, the closest anyone can come is evidence that this is financially uh, a good investment, um, but you'll never get proof. I had uh, the, the chief analytics uh, evangelist from Google on, uh, former chief analytics evangelist, and he was very, very uh, forthcoming and um, generous and fair in his discussion of why he and several of his team members are no longer there. And it falls into this category of we produced a lot of evidence, but we didn't produce any proof. And at the end of the day, and, and, and what I would ex extend there is if the chief analytics evangelist at Google with a team of other Google evangelists, this guy's written multiple books on marketing analytics. Uh, he has taught at Northwestern, uh, University of Chicago. Um, he's currently at Notre Dame's business school, like teaching marketing analytics. Like if, if teams of people that well versed in the expertise and in the subject, um, can't produce proof, I don't think anyone can. And I think a lot of people hang up on that. That said, I'm also hearing from people who are in companies, um, inside a VC portfolio, you know, generally some of the most aggressive of all saying, we know what the next growth lever is for the next 24 to 48 months. It's this evangelist thing. Take a look around and see if you know anyone that might fit the bill. And so yeah. um, I'm hearing from all kinds of different people, but but this ROI piece and the idea that it's an intangible benefit, um, you know, some people are like dropping down things in Salesforce saying, you know, evangelist influenced, evangelist influenced, like I influenced $4.8 million in revenue, but it's like, Okay, <laughs> kind of, you know, like just because you touched it doesn't like it, it. It's just hard. It's really difficult. And I think the people who are successful with it have leadership um, and executives that trust that this is valuable and know the power of relationship and are willing to do things that they know intuitively are right, um, even if they can't prove it. And they're willing to defend it against a board of directors if necessary. Yep, for sure. I mean, this is the problem that we have in the realm of customer experience and creating great experiences for our customers because we can't measure the size of someone's smile or you know how happy we made someone feel or angry we made someone feel of course we have 
you know, customer satisfaction scores and net promoter scores and all these things. But at the end of the day, like you were speaking about earlier, the importance of that human emotion and how that's really what drives someone's opinion of a company. It actually is not something that we can track. So, and I think we get too obsessed with data sometimes that like, if the data isn't saying it, then we shouldn't do it. If we can't see the direct ROI, then, you know, how can we justify the expense? Uh, but humans are not machines. <laughs> yeah. And we, there, there are yeah. M- multiple people uh, represented in human-centered communication speak to this kind of art and science balance. Um, and I think, you know, when we look at the science side of it, it, it goes back to um, Henry Ford's assembly line, which was, you know, Taylorism, Frederick Taylor, like scientific management. Like as we started to get a handle on um, – the fact that there are metrics that we can generate on the things that we're doing, like we became so fascinated with it. And some people still respect the balance of art and science and other people are beholden to um, the siren song of, look, I can, you know, I can see this. Like, well, no, you can see a representation of it. It happens to be in something relatively tangible that feels super uh, like solid, like a number, but the number might not even be right in so mm-hmm. many cases mm-hmm. for, again, d- data hygiene being the primary issue. But um, yeah. so anyway, there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, have you read the the book Build? I haven't. Um, it's But I'll take name- it as a recommendation. <laughs> Tony Fidel, who... Uh, yeah, totally. Nest in... Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, he... Where Apple and Philips and all these things. He writes about this... Uh, in the fact that you have to use your intuition when you're looking at data and the data isn't always right. Like sometimes the data might tell you, you need to do something. That's it. That's, that's getting into the spreadsheet and knowing, like feeling yeah. when it's off and honoring it, at least to investigate. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. It's cool. I'll, I'll add one more on for, for, yeah. for you know, I think, I feel like a podcast listener is very often a book reader or book listener. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll just layer one on Tony Fidel first came onto my radar when I was reading rich Carl guard, uh, he, who's with Forbes for a number of years. I think he was the executive editor or something. Um, he wrote a book called the soft edge and, uh, it was essentially about this, um, what, what we're using the language of art and science around, but it was like, there's the hard edge of business, which is, you know, what gets the most respect and study and all of this because it feels the most concrete. And then there's the, um, the soft edge, which is, you know, design and feel and these types of things. And so, um, Tony Fidel is featured in there, uh, I believe, um, for his design kind of prowess and intuition. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he made the iPhone, so we should trust him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to start closing us out. Yeah, please. Not because you want it to be over, right? No, I'm no, this is super fun. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I'd love to know about a recent experience you've had with a brand that left you really impressed. Gosh, this is kind of a lazy one, um, but like Amazon just com- consistently delivers. Um, you can't really trust the ratings that much anymore because those are all gamified. Um you can't always trust like the discounting because what looks like a discount today is actually the price that it was three days ago. But in terms of constantly adding little things like the idea of like, you know, rounding them all up and getting them on. And now I'm, this isn't like fresh or brand new, uh, but I just upgraded a number of aspects of my office because I, you know, as I left Bomb to join Follow Up Boss, I went from being in office to being it at home. So, you know, there's a lot of little stuff, you know, like and you're constantly kind of fixing the thing up even, yeah. you know, months into the journey. And so um, they've been on my doorstep quite a bit, but like little things like, hey, round all these up and send them on a Thursday um, instead of getting them throughout the week. Or even better yet, we'll bring it whenever the heck we want or whenever the heck we can, and we'll give you like a digital credit for it. This idea that if you don't like it, here are like six retailers that you can go take this thing to, um, et cetera, like um, just consistently good uh, in general, like not mind blowing, but the scale that they do it at the speed, the increasing speed. It's like, and so I guess what I want to highlight here is just the constant iteration and the constant improvement. Um, and while also acknowledging some of the fundamental flaws, totally. like, like, like the reviews, eh, kind of, I mean, I guess I can trust 5,000 people, but I know that a number of them were like, you know, incentivized that kind of a thing. Um, so th- they're not perfect. They, they have a number of problems like every other company, but, um, I'm consistently impressed. I guess I'll go one more. Um, as we're recording this in late 2023, um, I'm thinking back to, um, a, a road trip that my wife and I took to see family and friends around Thanksgiving. 
And so we were in a variety of Starbucks because we're early people. So we're in a variety, whatever Starbucks in that town was open at five or 5.30 in the morning we were at. And the cheery, cheery people in uh, a nice neighborhood in Kansas City, um, you know, the country club plaza type area, I think is what it's called. Um, with just the warmest, friendliest people. It was like the middle of the day to them, even though we're like just getting up and get ready to haul for like eight more hours east uh, from Colorado. And uh, so anyway, like, the, and, the, and that is just, it's the people. I and mean, the reason you go is that you know exactly what your order is. It's going to be very, very consistent in price and quality. Um, but the people are make the difference. And so my wife and I ended up having this ongoing conversation because we were probably at four or five Starbucks over the course of this period. Um, which ones stood out and which ones didn't? And it was 100% about the people and the way that they managed you. Like, hey, hey, I know I know you've been standing there for a minute, but you know, you're next up. Like I, I'm, I got your, you know, oat milk lattes coming up or whatever. So yeah. like just even these types of things. So anyway, um, yeah. Those are a couple oh, completely. that come to mind. And they're, and they're not like cool brands. I don't have like an amazing out-of-pocket story there, but um, they're, they're, it's real. But you just mentioned two brands that have completely changed the way that we live, like broad, broad strokes, right? Like Amazon, the way that we shop has fundamentally changed because of Amazon. Starbucks, coffee wasn't really a thing until, you know, the way that we drink coffee now is different because of what Star Starbucks did and made available to us. And there's something to be said about the size of those businesses. And I think so much of it has to do with the customer experience. Like they really focused on it and Absolutely. look at where they look at where they are now. And I'm sure there were things that they were like, we need to invest in this, even if we can't see the ROI, like, you know, delivering the same day, I'm still paying the same amount for that, but I'm definitely buying more. <laughs> so I, I'm sure that Amazon has some way of tracking that, but, um, no, they're, they're, they're both great brands. Good. Last question for you. What is one piece of advice that you think every customer experience leader should hear? Um, gosh, I feel like it's, uh, on all these themes that we've been in, it's not going to be super concise, but it's this idea that like the people are the difference. And of course, it's the it's the people who are customer facing. I mean, there's a, that is a big deal. Uh, but then there are also the people behind it. Um, and I guess I would also say something that should be a truism for for folks that listen to a show like this, which is that um, the customer experience and the employee experience are two sides of the exact same coin, and that the customer experience is the outflow or the overpouring or the outward expression or better yet, the peek behind the curtain of what the employee experience is really like. It's it's easy to put a smile on when you're miserable a couple of times, but it's impossible to do it all day, day in, day out, week in, week out. If people feel valued, appreciated, challenged, engaged, um, all the better. And so, um, yeah, I guess that. Keep the employee in mind. It is one of the things that I talk about, teach about, coach about, because it's just, it's so, so important. I've built and led multiple customer facing teams. And if they don't feel engaged and supported and that they have a home, you know, with their, with their team, it shows with the customer. It's, it's so connected. So yeah. thanks for bringing that one up. Good. Thank, thank you so much, Ethan. This has been such a great conversation talking about evangelism and human-centered communication, AI, and everything in between. I've really enjoyed it. For those of you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe and you'll get more, more of this very soon. So thank you so much, Ethan. We'll, thank we'll you. you. I soon. loved it. Salesforce Customer 360 is the world's number one AI CRM, helping companies build stronger customer relationships, drive faster time to value, and innovate with every technology wave. Learn more about their expert resources and support at sfdc.co slash Salesforce customer success.